But WGTK gives you Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. From relationship problems to family feuds, he's got all the advice and expert help you'll need. Here's Dr. Stan Frager. Good evening. It's Dr. Eli Karam sitting in for Dr. Stan. When I'm not occasionally filling in, I am an assistant professor at the Kent School of Social Work in the Family Therapy Program at the University of Louisville. Uh, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and the uh, president-elect of the Kentucky Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. But tonight I am your host for the next two hours. Glad to be part of the Sunday Night Family Filling in for Dr. Stan. We have a great show for our listeners tonight. We're talking about how to prevent bad things from happening to you and those you love. We will start out with uh, in our first hour with Kathy L. Uh, she will teach our Sunday night family the best things to uh, learn when setting up and executing an intervention. We hear so much about that term, and some of you have seen the TV show. So when we're setting up an intervention for a family member or a loved one that has a problem, how are we going to do that? That's in the first hour. Um, because it is Thanksgiving week, at the end of that first hour, we're also going to be joined by the founders of Blanket Louisville. That is a great opportunity uh, for you to help those less fortunate during this holiday season, not at the end of the hour. In our second hour, we're going to be joined by uh, Richard Hart and Fausta Lucini, and they're going to be talking about uh, prevention and recovery from sexual assault. So, as always, we welcome you, 502-571-0970. That's 502-571-0970. Call in, share your stories, and uh, we are going to start by talking to uh, Kathy L. Kathy, are you with us? Yes, Dr. Karam, I am. All right, you can call me Dr. Eli or just Eli. Kathy, um, you are um, very familiar with 12-step programs. You've been uh, a 12-step recovery editor for Bella Online since 2007, writing weekly articles on a variety of topics to support readers uh, throughout their addictions and their recovery. Your articles are read internationally and are used to help counselors, therapists, and support groups all over. You hold a degree in education with an emphasis on counseling. Uh, so welcome to uh, the program. Thank you, Eli. Great. It is great to have you. Let's start out first. As people say intervention, and, and like I said, maybe they've seen a television show on A&E, but it is such a, uh, a broad term. What exactly, uh, and you've written a book called, appropriately titled The Intervention Book, and we'll be talking about that uh, this hour. What does that mean when I say intervention to you? Uh, outline what that is for our listeners. Okay. Well, to me, and as you mentioned, most people today have seen it on TV in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I think we all want to think that intervention is exactly what we see on TV. The reality is I believe and have based my book on the fact that intervention is anything at all, anything, person, place, or thing that can come between um, an addict, whether it be, um, well, it could be a number of different things, but it's going to, for that, even if a brief second, is going to stop the mental and physical desire for the drug or whatever it is the person is addicted to. So, for example, um, an intervention could be um, a DUI. An intervention could be um, just meeting the right person at the right time. It does not mean the person's going to recover. It just means that there are so many little things that happen in the day-to-day -day of an addict's life that could be a part of recovery. Put them all together, and it could be. It doesn't mean that there's any one thing that's going to work for that particular person. But an intervention is really just an interruption that may lead the person to recovery at some point in time. I'm glad you brought that up. And a lot of people, I believe, think of drugs and alcohol, but that's not necessarily the case. It could be for any kind of addictive um, behavior or problem. Uh, what are oh, some? Oh gosh! Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm recovering alcoholic, but I can tell you that most—I can't say all—but most alcoholics probably have a nicotine problem as much as they do an alcohol problem. And believe me, the nicotine problem is as hard as the alcohol problem to shake. Um, you know, it's odd. We don't think of that as the kind of addiction that it is, but it's pretty deadly. Um, my book is really, um, well, I had the opportunity 
to interview people um, who are compulsive gamblers, mm -hmm. who are sex addicts, um, suffer from love addiction, and a real big one is food disorders. So being sober for your listeners just means being able to recover from any of those addictions. Everybody thinks sober means alcohol, but it's sobriety is just a term that we use to mean no uh, without addiction truly. Uh, you were mentioning you're a recovering alcoholic and so mm -hmm. many people that have a passion uh, that are involved in either conducting interventions or in some type of mental health field working yeah. with people with addictions have a personal story behind sure. uh, their work or their book. Say a little more about your background and how you got into this. Um, how I got into addiction or how I got into recovery. <laughs> uh, how you got into helping those uh, with addiction. Well, because I am an addict and, you know, um, it doesn't mean that you, it, it takes one to know one, but... Um, it's pretty hard to understand what happens in the mind of an addict or an alcoholic or whatever addiction you suffer from if you're not really familiar with it. Um, I've always been in a counseling type of profession. Um, even in my addiction I was, which is kind of scary, but that's the way it works. And I finally um, had an opportunity with Bella Online to start writing for um, other people in recovery. And, you know, we have a thing in 12-step programs. We want to give back what we were so freely given. So when people open up to you as an addict and you start to feel that you really understand what you are, which is, of course, the first step is getting rid of that denial, then I think you can start helping others. 12-step programs, um, that's what they're really all about. It, it's, it is helping each other. I have just been afforded the opportunity to go a little bit farther than that and um, be writing the article for Bella for the last number of years. And then, of course, um, having a huge opportunity to have my real wish come true, and that is actually having a book that is published. Great. Let's start, because I imagine we'll have a lot of listeners tonight that might have a loved one and they are very concerned about that loved one. Right. But mm -hmm. as, as just by the, the nature of the word intervention, generally these, these, these type of people are in the kind of, if you will, the pre-contemplation stage of change, meaning they don't think they have a problem, hence right. needing a, the, the intervention. So if we could just start talking now, we can talk more after the break. How am I going to mobilize? If I'm a listener out there, I, I love my family member, but I know I can't do this by myself, and I know the rest of uh, – my family members might not be on the same page with me. How do I even start thinking about uh, my loved one needs an intervention? I need to mobilize the troops. How can you? How, how do we start preparing to even get ready to do something like this? Well, I think the very first step, if you are the um, the one who knows that your loved one is um, is addicted to something, is first of all whatever the addiction you know you have to make it clear to yourself and this is kind of the hard part that you're not responsible that addiction is a disease and if you can if you can uh, realize that it's not your fault no matter what your your situation is no matter what your relationship is to that person and then it's very important I believe to start getting help for yourself you know I have a, a little scenario in my book where you get on a plane and you sit down with your child and um, the mask comes down and you're told to always put your oxygen mask on before you put it on your child. And this is exactly, it's kind of the exact same situation. Help yourself first before you can help anybody else because most people don't know anything about addiction. And the purpose of my book was to say to people, look, this is what you can do. There are steps you can take. You don't need to start rallying everyone yet, um, but know the disease. Go to 12-step meetings um, that, are, that are open to those, um, those people and, you know, really try to find out more and more that you can about the disease so that you can start understanding it. That's really the first step. Believe me, your friends and relatives already know there's a problem. Um, sometimes the person who's looking for the help, the person who wants to help, is, is entrenched in the disease as their, their alcoholic or addict um, loved one. So first step is take care of yourself. Okay, take care of yourself. In the process of taking care of yourself, what if you, you really care about this person, but you're not sure because they're very good at, and they might be a functional alcoholic, they might hold their job, they might not be impaired. 
So how do I know if they're just how do I know if they're addicted versus not just engaging in a bad behavior? One minute, uh, Kathy, before the break. Um, well, you don't, but would you want to take that chance? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if, if you have, again, I'll, I'll kind of compare it to if you have a person who um, can't breathe, um, you know, you immediately give them oxygen in some way, shape, or form, whether it's calling 911 or whatever it is. You're not going to wait and say, well, it may not happen again. Um, I think you people do really know deep down inside if it's just bad behavior or it is an addiction. Um, parents especially, I think, want to believe that it's bad behavior, it's common behavior, it's teenage behavior. But I've also had people immediately um, call someone for help and nipped it before. We'll be back with harder. more with Kathy L. We're talking about interventions for your loved one on Let's Talk, the Stan Frager Show. Call us, 571 571- 0970. Calling Dr. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Frager. You found Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. Dr. Stan Frager is standing by to give you insight on issues that matter most to you. Call now, 571 0970. Dr. Eli back. Sitting in with uh, for Dr. Stan this evening, I'm joined by Kathy Ells. She is an intervention expert and a uh, 12-step recovery editor for Bella Online. So we're talking, if you're a listener, uh, just joining us, you want to call in and you have a loved one out there that is in some trouble with uh, an addiction or addictive behavior, uh, please give us a call. She's here to, to answer your questions. Before the break, Kathy, we were talking about uh, kind of knowing when your loved one is in trouble Uh, You know, there's this popular saying that somebody, before they accept help, has to hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Do you need to hit rock bottom before you you have an intervention or before you uh, seek recovery? No, I I don't think so. I think for, um, I mean, I think that for the most part, we believe that before we enter recovery, we will hit rock bottom. But I've seen people think that, then uh, relapse and hit, hit a much lower bottom than that. No, you don't need to wait, and and I'm not quite sure why anybody should. Um, I know that seems to be the way, you know, way most people think, but I don't know how anybody knows what the bottom is. Um, You know, we think somebody's hit a bottom, and I've known young people who have ended up dying of alcohol or drugs, and, I mean, that's, that's about as bottom as you can go. So I'm not quite sure why anybody would want to sit around and say, well, wait till they hit bottom, because nobody knows that bottom, what that's going to be. Um, Hitting a bottom could be having a DUI and injuring somebody else, killing someone else. So, you know, when we're in in our addiction, it's not really about just the addict at at all. It's um, a disease that, that seems to kind of emanate and just hit about everybody around, whether it's friends, family, coworkers, whatever. But I do not believe that any person has to hit bottom in order to get help. Um, I think sometimes we think that because we hope that the addict will wake up, and that's the whole idea. Wake up now. How far down can you go? But, you know, there can always be a farther, a, a, a bigger bottom. Your uh, first commandment in the uh, last segment that uh, if you're trying to give your uh, loved one help, remembering that you're not responsible, right. that's Correct. sometimes easier said than done. And some oh, yeah. people believe uh-huh. Uh, that they can stop their loved one from hitting bottom. Do you think that's true? And what is the line between helping and enabling? Uh, and well, working with family systems yeah. and being a family therapist, we, we help uh, marriage and family therapists help families understand that sometimes mm-hmm. uh, their love of that person is blinding them and actually uh, colluding with them in their problem versus helping them get some uh, to do something different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Part of it is um, when, you, when you are the person who is so distraught over someone, um, you know, I'm, I, am, I am big on people going and seeking counseling. You know, intervention is usually the pretty, it, it's kind of a last resort, but certainly counselors as yourself, and you know, you know, you know this is a professional, um, we can't do it on our own. I mean, it's really important, I think, for the person who is, looking to help their loved one, that they seek the right people to to talk to. Talking to another friend or a relative, none of we're, we're not professionals. We don't know how to deal with this. You can make matters worse by doing that. So I'm, I'm big on having people go to a counselor, whether or not they really engage the other person at that time or not. 
But if I'm worried about my loved one, I need to find out what I can do. And the hardest thing for me to do is going to be able to or not to be not to enable that person. And, you know, you're right. There's a big difference between love and enable. Um, I have a, someone called me a while ago, and it was a, a son. He's an adult son, and the mother wanted to know what on earth she could do. The daughter's money had been stolen. The son stole the money. She called the police. She wanted to know where her son could have a safe haven away from the police. The father, of course, felt just the opposite, and this was a pattern they had obviously gone through because after 30-some years of marriage, they ended up in divorce because of this. One loved, one loved and enabled. So it is difficult, and it hurts. It it breaks my heart to see people have to um, uh, really, they they feel that they're punishing their children or, or their husband or their wife by by taking something away, kicking them out, not giving them money. But um, that's why they need the support of sometimes a counselor. There is a very fine line between love and enabling. Yeah, let me just highlight this point. Kathy is is telling telling you listeners out there that uh, even if you are not the quote-unquote identified patient or the person with the addiction, that uh, counseling or therapy can sometimes be a catalyst for you getting the help you need so that you don't enable that person. You put a plan together because unless you have a plan uh, and have some structure to dealing with this problem, it's going to be very hard for you to help the one you love. And you're, you're also talking about yeah, the, uh, a function of the symptom of the addiction is it can wreck whole families and wreck marriages and even long-term uh, if uh, you know, a co-parents uh, um, a uh, father and a mother cannot get on the same page of how to help their child, whether adolescent or adult. It can have uh, just uh, dramatic ripple effects on the whole family system. If 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 um, you have any advice for our listeners out there, Kathy, if uh, one maybe parent thinks that the their son or daughter has a problem, but the other does not, so one is ready to start looking um, for an interventionist um, or a treatment facility, but the other members aren't quite there yet. How do you get other family members on board before they Mm -hmm. contact someone like you? That's really hard. Um, And I've had, as a matter of fact, one of the stories in my my book, um, it happened to be that the parents were divorced, but that was the whole situation. Uh, The mother believed that the the boy was an addict and the father did not, and therefore the mother was the bad guy because he was going to help out. You know, the whole thing behind any intervention at all or any recovery is support. Um, no one person can do it by themselves. And so when you have a family who's just on different pages, I think, once again, I think you need to find a way to, to seek counseling and hopefully maybe it's even family counseling at that point. That has nothing to do with the addict. Um, but, you know, the, this is why it's such a, a terrible disease because I can just think of the yelling and screaming and fighting that happens, um, and it just tears everybody apart. There is no easy way. If somebody wants to believe that their loved one is not an addict, unfortunately, you can talk and talk and talk until you're blue in the face but until perhaps something happens, that person is in as much denial as the addict is. And for many people, they, have a, they feel guilty. Um, parents don't want to talk about it um, because they feel guilty. They, would, they don't want to say bad things about their children. And I'm glad you brought that up. Guilt is a primary emotion. Oh. Many people think that uh, you know, frustration or anger is really what's mm-hmm. going on. That's really oh, a smokescreen to guilt, yep. and it's hard uh, sometimes uh, when you love your child so much and also to admit that uh, as you said you're not responsible but many parents feel that way that is an indictment on the way they raised their child or if they would just been better they would have been more attentive this wouldn't have happened and I think you're right psychoeducation very important to the family system Mm -hmm. and we have to have to get family members on board because if you do not that addict will exploit the weakness the the break in the family you're listening to uh, Dr. Eli sitting in for Dr. Stan Frager tonight with uh, Kathy L we have a couple more segments coming up Kathy you're going to tell us about what's in the book after the break let's talk to Dr. Stan Frager show 
Let's talk with Dr. Stan Frager, helping you make sense of life's daily challenges and much more on 970 WGTK. Dr. My eyes have seen the Dr. Eli, back with you. We're talking to Kathy L., intervention expert. And Kathy, we actually have a, a caller on the line for you. Aaron, are you there? Hi, sure I am. All right, Aaron, ask Kathy uh, your question. Okay. Hi, Kathy. Um, Hi, Erin. I'm a nursing student, and I'll, I often see um, patients in the hospital who are struggling from some kind of addiction, and I would like to be part of helping them um, by maybe referring them to a type of recovery program or some of the other community resources that we have. That we have. And so I was wondering uh, what the best approach is to confront a patient like that, um, just because I'm you know, kind of afraid of offending them or maybe assuming the problem is worse than it is. So how would you recommend me um, maybe approach that coming from a nurse patient type of scenario? Well, you may offend them, but if that's the worst that happens, then that is not really such a bad thing. To be honest with you, if you offend them, that's probably the reality is they probably are addicts. And if you're a nursing student, You've probably seen enough even at this point to to know when someone is an an addict or not. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things you can do is um, I would maybe suggest getting a hold of some 12-step recovery information. Um, Give them information to read. It's not about you. Um, You really can't do more than that except um, do something like that. Um, 12-step recovery information you can get online. It's, it's usually certain of that is free. Um, you might want to talk to a relative if they're there, get a little more information without prying, mm-hmm. but be available that maybe they need somebody to talk to. Okay. Um, you know, so be available if you can without being, um, you know, kind of, what, what can I say, in their face about it because that's not really your job. Right. But if you really, truly want to help the entire person, then, you know, I'm thinking that probably um, say, you know, here, here's some information that might be interesting to you. You know, they may rip it up and throw it away. But let me tell you, this is the whole idea about intervention. What you do with one little piece of paper can be the beginning of recovery for that person. And that's really, you can't really do too much more than that, I don't think. But certainly you can do that, and that may be much bigger than you think it is. Great. Thanks for your call, Erin. Thanks, Erin. Thank you so much. All right, and you can reach us, uh, call in, uh, talk to Kathy, 571-0970. Kathy, tell us, uh, you talk about different types of interventions in Mm -hmm. your book. Quickly, uh, about three minutes. Tell us what's in the book, the different types of interventions that you're speaking of. Okay. Um... Well, when I was asked to write a book about intervention, I realized that the average person who was in recovery never did have uh, intervention with a formal or with an interventionist. And um, matter of fact, very few people have out of the people that I've met in recovery. So I've kind of looked at it in three ways. A formal intervention meaning that, yes, you have an interventionist and you arrange to meet that interventionist, what the interventionist can do for you. How do you find one? Um, What do you need to be prepared to do? What kind of support system do you need along to to work with that interventionist? And a lot of that is very much the same as you do see on TV. Um, The next is probably the most common, and that would be what I consider an informal intervention. Um, That's the person, place, or thing that just happens. It can be a series of things. Um, You know, it could be, um, it means that maybe the addiction is much longer, but within that period of time, certain things happen, certain people have come into someone's life, and the psychic change begins to happen so that over a period of time, there's one thing that happens, and that's it. I need to recover. I need to get out of where I am. That is what most people do. The third, and this is kind of what people say, oh, gee, you know, are you you talking higher power here? Yeah, I guess I am. Um, Divine intervention, I do believe that is not something that can really be pinpointed, but there are things that do happen to people that will be attributed to something more along the divine line, meaning um, 
maybe it's it's a human thing, but maybe it's just a higher power putting somebody in the place, and the first thing they think of is, this is divine. Um, and, and that's kind of, there are a lot of stories, and, and I have my own in the book about that. So the book really goes into the different kinds of interventions, but a lot of what recovery is all about, um, what is IOP, which is intensive outpatient, how do you pick a rehab facility, where do you go, do you go to online to an 800 number. And um, I then go through a number of um, explanations, what is, you know, about sexual addiction, about gambling, about love addiction, about food disorders. Are they different than anything else? No, nah, not really, but they might be approached a little bit differently. The timeline is a little bit different in some of those. And then the last part of the book is 20-some stories that were told to me by people literally all over the world that were happy to help Great. about their addiction and recovery. Uh, when we get back, we're going to tell them where to find the book. Uh, Kathy, and we're also going to talk about some of those other resources that you just mentioned. You're listening sure. to Let's Talk. This is Dr. Eli. One more segment with Kathy L., intervention expert. Calling Dr. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Frager. You found Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. Dr. Stan Frager is standing by to give you insight on issues that matter most to you. Call now, 571-0970. Dr. Eli Karam back with you. I'm speaking with Kathy L., intervention expert. Kathy, you told us before the break of these three types of interventions in your book, aptly titled The Intervention Book, Formal, Informal, and Divine. Well, uh, let's say you don't have enough time uh, to wait on divine intervention and you're not comfortable <laughs> with an informal intervention. Let's say I want to go the route of a formal intervention sure. like I've seen on the TV show. Sure. How am I going to find the right person to help me? What do I look for? How do I vet this interventionist? Where do I start? Well, you know, um, it's not one of those things that you usually just ask somebody down the street. You know, it's one of the, it, it's, it's a little bit different than that. And so what you really need to do is you can, you know, um, there is an organization of professional interventionists, and it doesn't mean that it has to be strictly an interventionist. It can be a, um, a counselor, a, um, a psychologist, anyone who deals with, an, with addiction can actually provide an, inter, uh, provide an intervention. So the important thing is, is that you need to find out that it's a person you're comfortable with. So. If you're picking up the phone or you're looking in the, in the, the, well, actually everything's online now, for an interventionist, you know, part of it is picking and choosing. The important thing is, though, that you really do like that interventionist, and the interventionist also wants to be comfortable with you because you are the person who's going to lead them and help them guide the family toward the intervention. The interventionist... Um, again, meaning, again, it doesn't have to be a professional interventionist, but the person who is responsible for the intervention, that person is a guide. That person is really just rallying the troops and getting the family on the same page. Um, and they are really sitting back, like we see on TV, and listening and being the intermediary when required because we've seen how tempers flare. That's the person also who should be able to provide um, information about a rehab facility. And I've been told by the interventionist that I interviewed for my book, Karen Zazara, that um, you should not even consider a rehab facility unless the interventionist has walked those grounds. They know exactly what you're going to get. And there are different types of rehabs for different kinds of addictions. So, you know, and money is a big, money is a big factor, too. Should I, uh, if, if I'm the family member, should I uh, collaborate with the interventionist uh, to find the re rehabilitation facility, yes. or should I expect them to lead the way and broker that uh, for me and my family members? Well, I think for the most part, they're going to look and they're going to look at something that satisfies you as their client. Um, they're going to find something in the right geographic location. They're certainly going to recommend um, based on their own information, their professional information, and their professional judgment as to what is going to be um, best, what's going to give their loved one the best um, rehab possible. 
but I mean, you can go your own way if you want. Personally, I mean, you can pick out a Betty Ford and um, Hazelden and things that are well known. But this country is chock full of rehab facilities. There's no lack of them. And I think I would just want to make sure that if I were spending that kind of money and I were really putting my loved one's recovery on the line with this, I would want to make sure that it was exactly what my loved one needed. You're right. In a lot of these rehabilitation facilities, as the family therapist, uh, I'm very uh, concerned about what's going to happen to the family at home while that person is in rehab because they might have a great transformative experience but if the family system doesn't change and accommodate to the changes that the person makes while they're in treatment, right. they're going to be put right. back into a similar environment um, that was part of the addiction. So I sure. think that's very important. Sure. And I also like what you said about the family being comfortable with the interventionist. And mm-hmm. it could be their therapist. It could be someone sure. um, that has formal training or might, might not in that way. Mm-hmm. How much time do you think the interventionist should spend with the family in helping stage and craft the intervention before it actually happens, Kat? Well, they, you know, they spend a number of hours. I mean, there, there's a, an initial meeting usually of at least three hours, um, and then they'll come back for another meeting. Um, again, it's everybody getting on the same page. Who are, who are we inviting? I mean, we're not inviting every friend we know. I had someone who said um, all her friends were invited. There was only one problem. Her friends were all addicts. Um, it didn't work. <laughs> um, and, and that's very important. You know, you want people that are going to be supportive, but you also want people, you know, the enablers need to be there also. And um, going back to what you mentioned, many, many families um, are offered um, rehab themselves. That's very important. If nothing changes in the home, then um, I can tell you, and, and you probably know from your own experience, nothing's going to change when the addict returns. Right. And those enablers helping the interventionist or the therapist, helping the enablers or the family members to come up with the bottom line, because if the uh, if the person with the addiction can see through it or feels like he can split the loved ones, it's sometimes hard to get that step uh, done. So I guess I'm curious as we're, we're winding down, tell us where we can get the book, the intervention book, and uh, you can also tell us more about what, what we can see on Bella online and how mm-hmm. people can contact you, Kathy. Sure. Um, Fortunately, the book can be found just about anywhere. Um, I Google it myself every now and then, and, um, you know, um, Barnes & Noble, um, Target, Walmart, um, Amazon, anywhere you possibly want, and it is being sold worldwide. So if there are listeners who are outside of the U.S., um, just about everywhere in the world at this point, as this is obviously um, a worldwide problem, meaning addiction. Um, In terms of Bella Online, well, I would ask that if somebody wanted to get in touch with me, they could be in touch with me at gratefulrecovery, that's one word, at gmail.com, and then I would forward them all the information they needed um, to get to Bella Online. It is, um, Bella Online is actually a huge site, and 12-step recovery is up as a portion of it. But I do write every single week and have for a number of years. And um, it is a service that I I provide for people who need it. That is is great, Kathy. I've learned so much. It's been, and thank you for an informative hour. We have about 30 seconds left. Uh, Can you give our listeners any other advice? You said you're not responsible if you're the loved one of someone with an addiction. Any other parting words of wisdom for our listeners around this? Uh, No, not really. Um, Just be patient. Um, patience is truly a virtue in this case and um, when somebody says I'm done uh, with whatever addict uh, whatever their addiction is then start working with them don't just believe them and walk away thank you so much for joining the Sunday Night Family Kathy thank you Eva bye bye